Good evening. Welcome to part two of the Coalfield Center's February event. My name is Jim Guth, and I'm a professor in the Department of Politics and International Affairs and a scholar in the Tocqueville Center for the Study of Christian uh, Democracy and Society. Uh, I'm substituting today for Brent Nelson, who many of you know uh, is off to Helsinki uh, to take an honored place in the inauguration of Alex Stubb as president of Finland. Alex was a graduate of Furman in 1993. Uh, so we're very proud of him and uh, we wish Brent good travels. Uh, please bear with me through these introductory remarks as my eyes are not particularly good uh, and like politicians of my age, I tend to ramble without a teleprompter. So uh, you know what's happening. The Tocqueville Center is dedicated to exploring the big questions asked by the best minds in the Western tradition. Sometimes that involves a discussion of the role of competition and cooperation in the works of Alex de Tocqueville and Charles Darwin. Uh, by political scientists like Robert Putnam and Sarah Gustafson. We also heard an important discussion of the role of religion in American politics by a distinguished panel of Molly Worth and Emma Green, Ryan Burge and Eric McDaniel. And we considered the black experience in America led by our own Monica Bell, Karhari Brown and Andrew Gillespie. Tonight, we continue our discussion of the conservative movement in the United States with four prominent public intellectuals, Helen Andrews, David Brooks, Matthew Continetti and Matt Martins. Tonight, we're going to hear David Brooks and Matt Continetti, each describing the conservative landscape in the age of Trump. Their presentations will be followed by a panel discussion uh, with the other two speakers. Uh, and time permitting, of course, we'll always take some questions uh, from the audience. Our first speaker is author and journalist and sometime college professor, David Brooks. David earned his BA from the University of Chicago and writes a weekly opinion column for the New York Times. As most of you know, he's a Friday political commentator for PBS NewsHour, opposite his liberal counterpart, Jonathan Capehart. Before joining the Times in 2003, David worked for the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, Newsweek, and the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, we found out last night he was also a police reporter early in his career, so uh, he has a wide range of experiences. Uh, he's the author of six books, including Bobos in Paradise, which is my favorite, uh, and will remain so, I'm sure, uh, On Paradise Drive, uh, The Social Animal, The Hidden Sources of Love, Character, and Achievement, which rose to number one in the New York Times bestseller list. His more recent books include The Road to Character, The Second Mountain, and his recent bestseller, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen Oneself. Uh, David is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Our second speaker is Matthew Cottonetti. Matthew earned his BA in history from Columbia University and is currently director of domestic policy studies and the inaugural is the inaugural Patrick and Charlotte, Charlotte Neal Chair in American Prosperity at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he's a prominent journalist and analyst. Uh, Matthew was the founding editor and, uh, and editor in chief of the Washington Free Beacon. He's also a contributing editor at the National Review, a columnist for commentary uh, and in addition, he's published articles in The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, uh, The Washington Post, among others. Uh, Matthew is also an important intellectual historian of the political right. His work is focused on American political thought and history with a particular focus on the development of the Republican Party and on the American conservative movement in the 20th century. He's the author of three books, including The K Street Gang, The Rise and Fall of the Republican Machine, the Persecution of Sarah Palin, How the Elite Media Tried to Bring Down a Rising Star, and most recently, uh, and most relevant to our concern tonight, The Right, A Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. Uh, we'll hear uh, first from uh, David and then uh, from uh, Matthew, and then we'll add uh, two more of our participants uh, for a panel discussion, and I'll introduce those folks later on. Uh, welcome, David Brooks. Thank you. It's good to be back for night two of the Tocqueville Center Focus on Conservatism. Uh, being conservatives, we're going to do everything we did yesterday all over again. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, uh, I'm going to talk a little about my journey into conservatism and then my journey recently 
still in conservatism, but in a different form. And now I grew up in New York City, uh, and you should know I grew up very left wing. My parents uh, grew up in different parts of the city. Uh, they went to a college called Antioch College, which was, uh, if the common turn was not left wing enough, uh, they went there. Uh, and we grew up in a left wing household. And so uh, when I was five in the late 60s, uh, the hippies were around, and the hippies would do, have these things called be ins. And a bee-in was where you would just go to be. Uh, and so I remember going, and there were hippies all around. They're singing folk music and dancing and putting flowers in their hair. And one of the things the hippies did as part of their being was they set a garbage can on fire, and they threw their wallets into it to demonstrate how little they cared about money and material things. And I was five, and I saw a $5 bill on fire in the garbage can. So I broke from the crowd, reached into the fire, grabbed the money, and ran away. And that was sort of my step over to the right. Uh, it didn't take. I remained a, a lefty through high school and through college, frankly. When I was 18, uh, the admissions officers at Columbia, Brown, and Wesleyan uh, decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, and uh, Chicago had a reputation for being conservative because Milton Friedman was there. Uh, but I didn't meet any. I was then still super lefty. And I was mostly involved in history. I don't think I read a newspaper in four years in college. Uh, it was a cerebral place, Chicago was, and we were sort of living in ancient Greece more than modern America. Uh, and um, it was my favorite saying about Chicago, the famous saying is that it's where fun goes to die. My favorite saying, it's a back to school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> and so I fit into that cerebral life. Um, I had a double major in history and celibacy while I was there uh, and did a thing with my college roommate. Uh, we entered him in the Golden Gloves competition. Uh, and we didn't, uh, we did it the Chicago way. He'd never boxed today in his life, but we gave him a nickname, the Kosher Killer, uh, and we practiced boxing the Chicago way, which was we read a lot of books about boxing. And so his illustrious boxing career lasted 92 seconds, um, but it was an experience. And then when I was, and then when I was a junior and senior, I was the humor columnist at the school paper, uh, and William F. Buckley came to campus. And he was then a famous columnist. And I wrote a vicious parody of him for being a name-dropping blowhard. And I can't remember all the jokes, but it was like, uh, at Yale, Buckley started two magazines, one called the National Buckley, one called the Buckley Review, which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. And it was sort of like a, in the afternoons, he, his hobbies are name-dropping and whatever. Um, so anyway, he came to campus, and he gave a speech to the student body. And at the end of the speech, he said, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. And so that was my first big break. Now, the sad fact, I was not in the audience. <laughs> I had actually been hired by PBS to debate, to debate Milton Friedman on TV. And so it was a show. He'd just done the show called Free to Choose. And he, he decided to debate college students having destroyed Nobel Prize winning economists in debate. And so you can go on YouTube and type in Milton Friedman, David Brooks, and you'll see me with the big Jufro, uh, these 1980s glasses that look like they were on loan from the Mount Palomar Lunar Observatory. And the show is basically me regurgitating some left-wing point that I'd read in a book somewhere, him destroying it in about six seconds, and then the camera lingering on my face for about 19 or 20 seconds as I try to think of what to say. And that was the whole show. But... Over the course of that time, uh, in the evenings, Friedman took us out to dinner. There were about six of us, three of whom later founded the Federalist Society. Uh, and he talked to us about economics. And I'd never met a non-lefty. And I didn't become a libertarian. I never became a Milton Friedman type of con libertarian. But it really opened my eyes to the possibilities. Also at Chicago, I was uh, assigned a book called The Reflections on the Revolution of France. And being a lefty, I hated the book because I wanted revolution. And here was a guy saying, don't trust your reason, trust tradition. If it's been around for a while, it probably has some validity. And I was just disgusted. And I wrote four or five papers on what a complete idiot this guy Edmund Burke was. Fast forward a couple of years, uh, and I'm a crime reporter in Chicago, and I'm covering mostly pretty nasty uh, criminals but I'm also covering two places, uh, housing projects, one called Cabrini Green and one called the Robert Taylor Homes. And these were housing projects that were built with the best of intentions. 
to tear down these ramshackle old slums and put up these new housing, housing buildings. And I got, by the time I got there, they were hellscapes. The gangs had taken over. To even get up to your apartment, you had to play the gang's protection racket. And they were well-intentioned projects that had gone completely bad. And as I was going in there day after day covering these things, I thought, you know, that guy Burke, he used to say you should be modest about how you can plan society because society is really complicated. And if you try to radically revolutionary, uh, revolutionarily change it, you'll probably screw up. And it occurred to me that he was kind of right. And so I opened my eyes to Burke. I reread Burke while I'm covering these projects. And about two years later, I call up Bill Buckley and I say, you remember that offer like three or four years ago? Is it still valid? And he said, yep. And I went to National Review and entered the world of conservatism. And I fell in love with it. I started because I had no background in it. I started reading every book I could get my hands on, a guy named Peter Varick, uh, Wilmore Kendall, Shirley Letwin, Russell Kirk, all these books that are now familiar to conservatives. I met people in the conservative movement. I got to meet the guy, James Burnham, who was a major figure. Uh, I got to meet eccentrics like Eric von Nuttall-Ladin, who was some sort of Austrian count or something like that. Um, and so I entered the world. And I started reading, and I can only say I was smitten. What I read was so much deeper than anything I'd encountered. And so I became a conservative. And years have gone by, and the last 10 years have not been particularly nice to my version of conservatism. And so I've probably drifted to the left, doubtless. But I went back a couple of years ago and I thought, you know, I'd like to reacquaint myself with those books that made me fall in love with conservatism in the first place. So I went back and reread them. And I was just as smitten as ever. And I may have become somewhat frustrated with the Republican Party and what call, is called conservatism, but I'm not, con I'm more convinced that those books are right than I ever was before. And so I'd like to just talk about what I found in those books and why they appealed to me then and why they appeal to me now. And so I'll tell my story of conservatism by going back to the religious wars of the 16th, 17th century. And these were vicious wars. There's a great book by uh, Sarah Blakewell about Montaigne called How to Live. And she has a guy in that book named Monluc, who's a duke, a local duke in the French village. And he was characteristic of the religious wars in that he was a mass murderer. I forget whether he was Catholic or Protestant, but he hung so many people, they, they had filled all the trees of the town. He stuck so many bodies in the well of his victims that they filled the well up to the top. And so these were the religious wars of that era, which were as vicious as you can imagine. And finally, after really decades and decades of bloodshed, they be, Europe became exhausted and appalled. And the urgent task was how to construct a society so it won't devolve into bitter polarization and bloodbaths. Now one camp, which we call the French Enlightenment, decided this religious world is bunk. We need to get rid of that and use the power of reason to celebrate society. Reason is our highest faculty, and we should build a society about rationality and reason and stop killing each other. Another camp, which we'll call the Scottish or British Enlightenment, people like David Hume and Adam Smith, decided that reason is nice, but it's not powerful enough to constrain our selfishness. Most of the time, our reason is helpless before our interest. And so these people were suspicious of reason. This is David Hume, or Edmund Burke, who became my hero, wrote, we are afraid to put men to live and trade each on his own private stock of reason, because we suspect that this stock in each man is small. We're just not that rational creatures. And so the key phrase I took from Burke and still take from it, it's not lot, he didn't write this phrase, but it's my summary, is the phrase epistemological modesty. The world is really complicated, so should we, be, we should be modest about what we can know. And that change, therefore, should be constant, but should be incremental and gradual. And so that's sort of the Burkean approach to life, which is cautious and incremental. And so down the centuries, conservatives have always stood against the arrogance of those who believe they have the ability to plan society. The French revolutionaries who fought their revolution to upend everything in French society, the Russian and Chinese communists who started with grand dreams and ended up with the gulag, the Western government planners who thought they could fine tune the economy from the top, the 
unelected bureaucrats in Washington and Brussels who think they can manage societies by fiat from the top. Now, if conservatives don't think reason is strong enough to order in a civilization, what human faculty do they trust to do this job? What in us can we really trust? And so the 18th century conservatives had a concept, and the word they used was the sentiments. Burke's first book was about aesthetics. When you look at a painting, you don't have to think about whether you think it's beautiful. When you look at an admirable action, you don't have to think, is that admirable or is that disgusting? You just know. Your sentiments, your unconscious processes, your ability to form instant aesthetic judgments, those things, conservatives said, are really what's trustworthy. Those things tell you what is beautiful and admirable, what is good and bad, what is worth wanting and what is not worth wanting. And the most important sentiments are moral sentiments. Conservatism certainly has an acute awareness of sin, greed, lust, disordered desire. But conservatives also believe that in the right circumstances, people are motivated by positive moral emotions, especially sympathy and benevolence, but also admiration, patriotism, charity, and loyalty. And these sentiments move you to be outraged at cruelty and feel proper affection for an imperfect persons who are doing the best they can. So emotions can be trusted. David Hume fam famously wrote, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. Uh, James Q. Wilson, who became a hero of mine, a 20th century conservative writer, the feelings on which people act are often superior to the arguments they employ. Now the key fact to know about emotions is that they're not always right. They have to be cultivated effectively. You have to cultivate your emotions. You have to educate your emotions if you're going to have the right moral reactions. And to educate your emotions, you have to be within societies that know how to form your, your emotions properly. Uh, and so Burke argued that if you lived in a state of nature, like John Locke imagined, you would grow up without families, without, in, without institutions to cultivate your emotions, and you would be slave to your passions, and the only way to govern such a person would be through a prison state. But fortunately, we don't live in a state of nature. We live with the families, we live with churches and synagogues and mosques, we live tr with traditions and ways of being. And these ways of being accumulate the wisdom of the ages of how to live, uh, and slowly they enculturate us. People learn virtues the way they learn crafts. They're not, they don't study them, they're imparted to them through practice and habit. And slowly you learn how to be. And so your educations are emotions. Your educations get educated. When you join the Marine Corps, you don't have to rationally think, how do I become a Marine? Your insides are changed to the whole Marine ethos is poured into you. And you know what you admire and what you don't, what is right and what is wrong, how to stay fierce against for, foes, loyal to friends, and loyal to the core. Now, if someone asked you, what do you do when your spouse dies? The obvious thing is not to say, well, you should throw a party for the next week. But the Jewish Shiva ritual is a brilliant social ritual that gives people who are in grief something to do. It surrounds them with community, and it is a form of community that educates us on how we behave in community, how we sit with those who are suffering. Burkean conservatism inspired me because its social vision was not just about laws and budgets and technocratic plans. Its vision was about soul craft, about how we build institutions that will produce good citizens, people who are moderate in their zeal, sympathetic to the marginalized, reliable in their diligence, willing to sacrifice private interests for the public good. I once came across a, a school in England called the Soul School where the headmaster said, our job here is to produce students who are acceptable at a dance, invaluable at a shipwreck. We want to cultivate people who are trustworthy. Burke wrote, manners are of more importance than laws. Upon them in great measure the laws depend. The law touches us here or there, now and then. Manners are what vex and smooth, corrupt or purify, or exalt or debase, barbarize or refine us. They give us the whole form and color to our lives. According to them, they aid morals, they supply them, or they totally destroy them. So being polite is a form of soul craft.
Conservatives also spend a lot of time defending what Burke called the little platoons, those little communities that educate us on how we should behave in the day-to-day -day complex cities of life. Each community has their customs and norms and ideals. The conservative seeks to defend the wonderful heterogeneity, heterogeneity of all these different little platoons. And they rebel against when government tries to rationalize them. Burkean conservatives believe that re reason functions well when your inner life is well ordered, when your sentiments and desires and motivations have been well formed in these seedbeds of virtue. We rational beings need customs and institutions that are founded in something other than choice if we're going to put choice to good effect. Roger Scruton wrote at the conservative philosopher, this insight is probably the one contribution conservatism has made to intellectual life. That we're going to be, be, have, be rational individuals, we have to be raised in institutions that precede choice. Family, nation, community, uh, organization. So conservatives, true conservatives' great virtue is that it teaches us to be humble about what we think we know, it gets human nature right, and it understands that we're primarily a collection of unconscious processes, deep emotions, clashing desires. Conservatives' pr profound insight is that it's impossible to build a healthy society strictly on the interest, on mutual self-interest. T.S. Eliot, the great conservative poet, write, it is an illusion to think you can build a society in which people in it don't have to be good. And so it put moral philosophy at the center of everything that we do, including practical politics. And so this tradition, these wisdom, comes down to us through the procession of the ages. Burke famously wrote, society is a partnership in all science, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and all perfection. As the ends of such a partnership cannot be attained by many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are dead and those who are to be born. And so if we're here at Furman, you guys who are here at Furman or Lender or anywhere, you're the inheritors of those who came before. They shaped the institution and they shaped who you are, even though you might not think it. By the early 1990s, I was living in Brussels, a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And I was fascinated to learn of a guy named Enoch Powell. Now, Enoch Powell was a conservative statesman, and if you had designed a perfect conservative statesman, it would have been Enoch Powell. He was a brilliant Oxford Don, he was a poet, a classic scholar, he'd been a war hero. But he gave a speech which puzzled me. And the speech became known as the Rivers of Blood speech. And he gave this speech in 1968, long before I came along, but I read about it. And I wondered, I'm a conservative, he's a conservative. And I found his rivers of blood speech atrociously racist. And so how could something I believe in also be, how could one of the paragons of the conservative I thought I believe in also produce somebody who just believed in tribal racist warfare? And I realized that every worldview has the vices of its virtues. Conservatives are supposed to be epistemologi epistemologically modest but in real life, in real politics, this modesty can turn into a brutish anti-intellectualism. Conservatives are supposed to prize local communities, but in real life, this can turn into a narrow parochialism and produce xenophobic and racist animosity toward people who don't look like us. Conservatives are supposed to cherish moral formation, but this can turn into a rigid and self-righteous moral moralism, a tendency to see all social change as a kind of moral decline. And so I was seeing the dark side of the thing I really loved, the conservatism I really loved. And when I looked at conservatives in continental Europe, I generally didn't like what I saw. What I saw was a group of people who believed in blood and soil conservatism, that race, that roots, that prejudice and xenophobia were common on the right in the conservatives I saw. Fortunately, I didn't have to live within the consigns of European blood and soil conservatism because I'm an American. Conservatism is so rooted in local mores and manners of each community, there is no such thing as international conservatism. Each community has its own traditions, its own values, and its own kind of conservatism who want to defend those values. And so American conservatism de de descends from British conservatism, but it's not British or European conservatism. It's different. And it d it's distinguished in three ways. 
First, the American Revolution, because that war was fought not only to preserve a way of life, but on behalf of liberal ideas. So the order that American conservatives defends are liberal orders. Second, while Burkean conservatives put a lot of emphasis on stable communities, America is a nation of immigrants and pioneers who always, always emphasize mobility and freedom and climate and the optimistic idea that the purpose of life is to transform your condition. Finally, American conservatives have been more unabashedly devoted to capitalism and to the entrepreneurialism and business generally that conservatives almost anywhere else. Perpetual dynamism is part of the tradition we want to serve. And so I realized I was a Burkean, but I was not only a Burkean, I'm also an American, and you can't be a pure Burkean in my view and also be an American. And so I wanted to preserve my Burkean side, but I also realized that another hero, this quintessential American hero, named Alexander Hamilton. Now, as you know, Alexander Hamilton is a Puerto Rican hip hop star from Washington Heights. <laughs> but he's also a guy who came here with nothing and who was an orphan, basically. And if you've seen the musical, you know he rose and became chief of staff. He became a military hero. He became one of the founders. He became, I forget by what age, but a young age. He re retired as the most successful Treasury Secretary and American hero in history. He is the epitome of America in that it's a story of mobility and climbing. It's not just this story of stasis and respect for tradition. And so an American conservative is in the uncomfortable position of trying to preserve people like, like Hamilton and also respect people like Burke. And the creativity of American conservatism comes out of that fusion, that tension between these two opposite ideals. And so American conservatism has always been in tension with itself. It's always been divided between libertarian, religious conservatives, small town agrarians, urban neoconservatives, foreign policy, foreign, foreign policy hawks. And for a time, this fusion of all these different influences, which sometimes seem to be in contradiction with itself, sort of worked. American conservatism in that era of my youth was held together by think tanks, by William F. Buckley, by Irving Kristol. It was all sort of put together. And it felt like we had held off the thread of blood and soil nationalism, held off the thread of what Enoch Powell's The Rivers of Blood speech represented to me. And that we called it the conservative movement. It really was a movement. I grew up with people of all different sorts, but we all felt part of a common project. And it really was not only my intellectual crew, it was my social life, it was all my friends, it was the people we married. Now in my own view, what we call conservatism today, the populism of Donald Trump, is nearly the opposite of Burkening and conservatism. And so how did a movement that built upon its, itself on sympathy and the wisdom lead to a man who in my view possesses neither? How did a movement that puts such importance on the moral formation of the individual end up nominating a man who is an unashamed amoralist? How did a movement built on an image of society as a complex organism give rise to crude dichotomies between the people and the elites? How did a movement that believes in the respect for tradition and following the ways of the past give way to a man who says, I alone can fix it? It is hard to imagine a least conservative sentence than I alone can fix it. And so the reason conservatism devolved to Trumpism are many. Uh, and I have a lot of sympathy for people who support Donald Trump. I have a lot of my family and my friendship groups. My line is that Trump is the wrong answer to the right question. But nonetheless, it's been a departure from the economics or the, the conservatism that I grew up in. And when I look back, to be honest, a lot of what I object to in Ian Powell and object to in tr some Trumpism was there all along. And my mentor, I didn't know it at the time when I worked for him, but I hope we've all seen the debate he had with James Baldwin in which William F. Buckley is pretty disgraceful. And that prejudice, that insularity, there were seeds of that in the, that were there all along. And by the time I got along, I think it had been cleansed. But you have to admit the seeds were there. Second, conservatism was betrayed by libertarianism in my view. In the 1980s, what had seemed like conservatism became just raw anti-governmentism. And 
humans were reduced not to the people who need moral formation, but to the rational choosing of individualism, a crude and dumbed down version of what Milton Friedman ta was talking about. And so we became economics first, hatred of government second, and nothing else. George F. Will wrote it in 1984, there is an imbalance has emerged between the political order, meticulous concern for the material well-being being of the economic sort of side of our nature, and a fastidious withdrawal from concerns for the inner lives and the moral character of our nature. The purpose of the right became maximum individual freedom, and especially economic freedom, and not much of a view of what that freedom was for. The biggest change was spiritual. British and American conservatism, as I first came to know it, was supremely self-confident. Henry Steele Commander, a historian, wrote, nothing in all history had ever succeeded like America, and we all knew it. That is legitimately how I felt. That is legitimately how I felt as I covered the end of the Soviet Union and the Western triumph in the, in the end of the war. By 2016, that confidence, for a lot of reasons, because of Iraq and Afghanistan, the financial crisis, that confidence was in tatters. Communities were falling apart, families were breaking up, America was fragmenting, whole regions were being left behind. Trump could come along and not say morning America, but he could say American carnage, and a lot of people res resonated with that. And so we've walked away from the, the dream and the, the conservatism that I knew about, which I still believe in. And so what's a working conservative like me to do? What's somebody who believes in Alexander Hamilton and Edmund Burke to do? Well, I'm not a Trumpian populist, and I could spend my life trying to restore the Republican Party to the way it was when I was young. But A, I don't think that's ever going to happen, and B, I'm 60. <laughs> I'm not going to live to see that Republican Party. And so I decided, though I have a lot of qualms with the Democratic Party, and though the left can trigger me in a way the right never can for some reason, and I become, I, I get so infuriated by liberal smugness. <laughs> I can't tell you, you should see me walking around in the hallways of the New York Times. Um, and yet I've decided that the problems that we need solving now are not the problems that we needed solving in the 1980s. Then the chief problem was sclerosis. Our societies were aging and we needed Reagan and Thatcher to give them dynamism. Now our core problem is fragmentation. And we need somebody in government who can take money and give it to the high school educated people who have been left behind. And in my view, Joe Biden has done a pretty good job of that. And so as someone who grew up on the right, rooting for Republicans for all those years, I now find myself in the uncomfortable position of rooting for the Democrats but I think I'm being consistent with my conservatism. And I think the, there is sort of a moderate democratic party that is liberal defending liberalism, defending social cohesion, respectful of tradition. And I mentioned last night, my hero, another hero of mine is Isaiah Berlin. Uh, and he said, he was a man of the left and then he became more conservative and he said, I'm happy to re represent the rightward edge of the leftward tendency. So I'm happy to be the most rightward Democrat it's possible to be and still comfortable paying homage to my heroes, Burke and Alexander Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you all for coming. My story is somewhat similar to David's, has a slightly different ending, and it's 20 years later. So <laughs> kind of like the, the epilogue in a way. Um, recently, I was asked how Washington, D.C. has changed since I went to work there in the summer of 2003. Uh, I had gone to Columbia University um, I'm from Northern Virginia. My parents uh, were not very political people, um, but uh, we had a strange ritual. On Saturday nights, we had family time, and family time consisted of watching the McLaughlin Group at 7 p.m. and a show called Inside Washington at 7.30 p.m. And so it kind of grew up uh, 
as a political junkie. So I was always interested in politics, but I was not you know, political. And I certainly didn't think of myself as a conservative when I went to Columbia. And it is a funny thing. We can talk about Furman, but the Tocqueville Forum, um, great books have subversive effects. So when you ask a young person, you know, how did you get to be a conservative? Oftentimes you will hear the answer, um, well, I just couldn't stand all the liberal professors at the school I went to. Or these days you might hear about the campus culture driving people to the right. In my case, it was the core curriculum at Columbia, where they forced you to read in your second year the great works of Western political thought, beginning with Plato and ending with Nietzsche. And I remember distinctly where I was in September of 2000, and uh, well, this would be September of 2000, uh, reading Republic, Plato's Republic. And I hit upon this passage, which is an exchange between Socrates and his interlocutor, Thrasymachus about the nature of man. And I, it, it was as though I like had a shock. And I realized well, that worldview, that idea of human fallenness, and the idea of human selfishness that Socrates is teasing out of Thrasymachus, that's what I believe. I agree with him. I see it there. And I kind of just fell into the tradition of political thought from there. And so I was reading Hobbes, and I was reading Locke, you read the Federalist Papers, you read Burke, you read Adam Smith. By the end of that year, I was saying, I'm a philosophical conservative. And that opened the world to me. So meanwhile, I had discovered opinion journalism, writing about politics and policies in the realm of ideas, and the conservative intellectual movement as it, by reading uh, writers like Jonah Goldberg in National Review Online, and this other writer, maybe you heard of him, David Brooks in the Atlantic Monthly. I recall how much I loved reading Bobo's in Paradise, the aforementioned, um, that was then in paperback in the summer of 2001. And so I'm still in school and I learned that this, this guy, David Brooks, worked at a magazine called The Weekly Standard. And so at a newsstand near Columbia, I picked up the latest issue of the magazine and it featured a cover story by David Brooks. And the cover, cover image was of Gilligan from the classic TV sitcom, Gilligan's Island. And the headline on the cover read, Farewell to American Greatness, David Brooks. And the next day was September 11, 2001. And I was in New York City. And I was a junior a resident advisor to about 35 kids who had showed up from all around the country and the world a week earlier. And we were on the 14th floor of John Jay Dorm with a front row seat to the attacks. So. That experience, combined with what I was learning, was definitely pushing me to the right politically. And over my final two years in college, I immersed myself in politics, political thought, conservatism, and this branch of conservatism called neoconservatism. And in, in addition to National Review and the Weekly Standard, I read The New Republic, then edited by the noted liberal hawk Peter Beinart. Things have changed, as I said, 20 years is a long time and The Nation magazine, where my favorite columnist was a man named Christopher Hitchens. Again, things change. I followed blogs like Andrew Sullivan's Daily Dish and Mickey Counts' Counts Files, and I compiled a stack of writing clips that helped me earn a year-long postgraduate fellowship at the Weekly Standard, where I was looking forward to working alongside David Brooks. So I met David in the Standard offices in mid-July 2003, and two weeks later, he quit and moved to the New York Times. So it must have been something I said. I always kind of blame myself for that. So when I arrived in Washington that summer, there was a coherence, I think, to conservatism that no longer exists, and maybe wasn't even really there to begin with, as I write about in my book. The Standards office was in an office building at 1150 17th Street Northwest. And on the same floor as the Standard was a a think tank, a small think tank, five people writing memos called the Project for the New American Century. There was also the Philanthropy Roundtable was on our floor. Um, the top floors of this building housed the American Enterprise Institute, where I work today. A block over on 15th Street was the journal The Public Interest. You could walk up Connecticut Avenue and go to the DC offices of the Hoover Institution. Uh, EPPC, the Ethics and Public Policy Center, that was around the, the corner on M Street. Everything was compact, everything was located, everyone knew each other 
In 2004, when two editors of The Economist magazine wrote a book called The Right Nation, Conservative Power in America, I felt a thrill of recognition when the authors identified 1150 17th Street as the center of a right bank of intellectual activity in the nation's capital. Well, that right bank is gone now. It's eroded. The building at 1150 17th Street was demolished in 2016. In fact, a friend reminded me recently that a fire broke out in the rubble on election night 2016, a physical manifestation of that election's impact on the conservatism that I inherited when I arrived in 2003. PNAC, the Project for New American Century, and the Weekly Standard no longer exist. 2003 is a distant memory. It's history to many of the people in this class, in, in, this, in this group. And the intellectual community there dispersed. And I've spent the last decade wondering why, asking why. I think when a lot of people diagnose or try to diagnose what's happening in American politics, they tend to look at the large structural forces at work. They talk about geographic realignment, the rise of the New South and the Sun Belt and how that shaped the Republican Party of the last half century. These days, more often than not, they talk about the educational realignment, how politics is being defined by educational attainment with non-college voters moving into the Republican Party en masse and college degree holders and postgraduate degree holders being the core of the new democratic coalition. I think all that stuff's true, and I write about it frequently in my work. All these larger demographic changes and structural changes, the weakness of our party apparatus, the growth of social media and how it influences public discourse, all these are important. But for our purposes tonight, and for the interest of time, so we can get to the discussion, I want to emphasize just briefly the role of contingency and personal agency in how uh, we have arrived at the present moment. If you think about it, about 10 years ago, we had this kind of bubble in the discourse surrounding what was called the libertarian moment, right? So we were coming off the creation of the Tea Party in 2009. We had uh, the populist uprising, we had Barack Obama recently re-elected, and the face of the Tea Party was Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. And he was advocating for a foreign policy that in many ways anticipated or captured certain aspects of Trumpian foreign policy, or, uh, or certainly the foreign policy of many of Trump's biggest supporters in the Congress, that turn away from international engagement, that turn away from American leadership that sense that maybe we're not always backing the wrong side. But the libertarian moment failed. We don't live in the libertarian moment. It lasted about six weeks. Why did the libertarian moment fail? I think it failed for reasons of contingency and reasons of personal agency. What was the contingency? The contingency was ISIS. When ISIS began appearing out of the rubble of America's withdrawal from Iraq, and the ISIS groups started chopping people's heads off, including Americans, American voters did not want Rand Paul's foreign policy. They didn't want Barack Obama's foreign policy. Obama wanted to stay out of Iraq and Syria for as long as possible. They wanted to smash ISIS. They wanted to re-engage with the world, and they wanted to secure America by combating terrorists overseas. So that was the contingency. Then there's the question of agency. How did agency end the libertarian moment? I'm just put it this way. Rand Paul, not up to the task of leading a mass movement in American politics. He's an eccentric figure. He certainly has a well-defined point of view, but he doesn't have the mass appeal or the performative qualities that someone like Donald Trump possesses. Right? So he wasn't able to pull it off. He wasn't able to lead a movement like Trump does. So when we think about the other contingencies and choices that led us here, I would focus on a few that brought us to the Trump era in American politics. And I think many of these contingencies, many of these events happened in Barack Obama's second term. The first, I believe, was the Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage around the country. I think it pushed the, any parts of the religious right into an oppositional 
attitude toward America and toward the institutions of American government and toward American culture. And so I remember uh, teaching, I was teaching at the time a group of um, Jewish Orthodox high school students on the day that Obergefell was decided. And one of the young students who went to yeshiva um, had heard about the news and he said to me, well, it's all over now. And that sense of pessimism, that sense that America was moving toward a place where it had never been, where civilization had never been, I think was deeply affecting large parts of the religious right and made it open towards someone like Trump who would say, well, I might not agree with you on everything, but you and I share the enemy, the same enemy. A lot of the work that had been done for decades to make the religious right believe in a, in a confluence between themselves, a congruence between themselves and American principles and believe in the sympathy between religiosity, public um, religion in the public square and American political ideals began eroding. The second event was the border crisis. The crisis that we have on the southern border today is longstanding. The children started showing up around 2014. The politics of immigration had always hurt establishment Republicans that have been referred to earlier in this forum. And Barack Obama's response to the children's arrival, the unaccompanied minors, made the immigration um, issue that more important for people on the right. What's more, immigration and international terrorism became fused in the public mind. Um, the idea of that ISIS would lead to attacks like you saw in France, then with the attack in San Bernardino. This was a way in which the politics of immigration um, began moving people to the right, making them open to Trump and to Trumpism. And I think the third contingency was the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Out of the Ferguson unrest, out of the Trayvon Martin shooting in 2012, all of these events and their effect on the political left and the political right began moving the Republican Party to a place where it would be open to a leader like Trump. But you need agency. And that's where Trump comes in. Trump, uh, as I was saying last night, is I think fundamentally a performer. And he's a brilliant performer. He puts on a show. He can make everyone, or almost everyone, laugh despite themselves. Or laugh because they want to be part of his club. He's always pushing. He doesn't care about the consequences. And he will not stop unless he's defeated in the polls. But you also have the agency of other Republican institutions. The sense that among many Republican officials that they were so crosswise with their voters, in many cases new voters who had never been part of the earlier Republican coalition, that they had to join Trump. They had to appease these new forces. That's an act. That's an act. That's a choice. Each step along the way, there were choices made not to push back, not to resist. So as much as we look at these larger forces pushing our country where it's going, we also need to recognize that events matter and choices matter. And we need to recognize that we still can choose. So uh, the topic of this forum was the state of the conservative movement. I don't think there's a coherent conservative movement in America today. Uh, the remnants of the pre-2015 conservative movement are fighting what seems to be a rearguard action against another movement, the MAGA movement. And that's why I prefer to simply refer to as the right, right? It's more capacious. It allows for disagreements. I think the right agrees on several policy ends, but disagrees about the means to achieve them. The People's Republic of China, the right agrees it may be our chief adversary in the 21st century, but there's no consensus on how to meet that challenge. The right agrees that it is anti-woke, doesn't like woke. Yet the factions differ over what it means to be anti-woke. Shall legislatures exercise control over academic speech in institutions of higher education? Shall legislatures remove subsidies and loopholes from corporations that adopt left-wing politics? Should legislatures or presidents break apart social media platforms and other tech giants such as Amazon? There's disagreement. 
So as the future unfolds, it is my belief that conservatives must return to the wisdom of their best minds and advocates. William F. Buckley Jr. put it this way in 1970. He said, I see it as the continuing challenge of American conservatism to argue the advantages to everyone of the rediscovery of America, the amiability of its people, the flexibility of its institutions, of the great latitude that is still left to the individual, the delights of spontaneity, and above all, the need for superordinating, that's a Buckley word, the private vision over the public one. In my view, this rediscovery of America must center on America's founding documents, for there would be no American conservatism without the American founding. The Constitution and its amendments ground conservatives who are eager to preserve and extend the blessings of liberty that are the right of every American. The Constitution grounds conservatives in a uniquely American tradition of political thought that balances individual rights with popular sovereignty through the separation of powers and through federalism. The Constitution not only protects human freedom, it creates the space for the deeper satisfactions of family, religion, community, and voluntary association. One cannot be an American patriot without reverence for the nation's enabling documents. One cannot be an American conservative without regard for the American tradition of liberty those documents inaugurated. America cannot abandon the great principles of classical liberalism, wrote the philosopher Harvey Mansfield, above all the principle of self-government and with it the constitutional means for achieving and preserving it. So the long and winding road on which the various bands of conservatives or the four conservatives you've heard from in the past two days have traveled has brought us, I think, to a fair amount of political power, but also to a large degree of cultural despair. Conservatives are confused, uncertain, anxious, and increasingly inward looking. That building I described at 1150 17th Street is gone, but the story does not end there. The question is, can conservatives harmonize their principles with the sentiments of the current populist revolt? Can they reformulate a conservative governing class for the second quarter of the 21st century? I am confident they can, for when you study conservatism's past, you become convinced that it has a future. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask our other panelists to join us if we can, and I'm going to introduce the uh, uh, two panelists who are going to uh, join David and Matthew in uh, discussing uh, their presentations. Uh, and you heard from them last night if you were here, and I'm sure we anticipate uh, similar uh, good work this evening. Helen Andrews is a senior editor at the American Conservative. She received her BA degree in religious studies from Yale University. Uh, her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, First Things, Claremont Review of Books, Hedgehog Review, and many other uh, outlets. In 2017-18, uh, she was a Robert Novak Journalism Fellow. Uh, her most recent book is called Boomers, The Men and Women Who Promised Freedom and Delivered Disaster. I kind of take exception to that title, but uh, uh, I'm a, pretty close to being a first boomer. So. I, our second uh, panelist is Matt Martins, uh, who is a trial lawyer and a partner at the international law firm of Wilmer Hale in Washington, D.C. He earned his J.D. at the University of North Carolina and an M.S. at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, he served as law clerk to Chief Justice uh, William Rehnquist at the U.S. Supreme Court and as a political appointee in the cr uh, criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice in the George W. Bush administration. He has spent most of his 27-year legal career practicing criminal law, both as a federal prosecutor and as a defense attorney. Uh, his newly published book is called Reforming Criminal Justice, A Christian Proposal. Uh, please give our panelists a hand. As is our custom, uh, I think what we do is ask our uh, two uh, additional panelists uh, their reaction to uh, David and uh, Matthew's uh, presentation, uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some time for uh, your questions uh, toward the end of uh, the period. Uh, Helen, let's start with you. I suspect you may take uh, some exception to uh, the presentation. Oh, only a little. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I never really thought before about how much David and I have in common, but we are both members of the very small club of people, probably fewer than 100 in the world, for whom the story of their journey to conservatism starts with how I got a job at National Review. <laughs> Uh, but my my version of the story 30 years later was very different than David's. He joined in the 1980s and was exhilarated. I joined in the Obama years and it quickly made me just want to kill myself. Uh, I, I should hasten to state uh, clearly at the beginning that all of my colleagues at NR were wonderful people. They were smart. They were dedicated. And nobody there was a hack. Everybody that who worked there did so because they wanted to make America a better place. But the overwhelming atmosphere around the office was one of stasis. And I think the moment when I knew I was gonna quit that job, as I eventually did, was when uh, we were sitting around the you know, at the editorial table, having a meeting, talking about the differences between the golden days of NR and all, all, when all of our heroes worked there and what we were doing today and, and how the magazine had changed. And someone very senior in the operation said, well, I, I, I see them as having lived through the heroic age and our job now is not to do what they did, but to guard the flame that they lit. There, there are no more new ideas in conservatism to be discovered, only applied. They, they did the work, we are now protecting their achievement. And, and you may think I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but really only lightly. It really was the sense there that everything had been discovered and there was no more progress to be made, just, just you know, we're conservatives. And I look at America and I see things falling apart and I say, you guys are not even it's not that you're not up to the task of adapting conservatism. It's that you're not even trying. You don't see the way things have gone wrong. So that, that, that was my, and, and I, feel, I feel like a lot of institutions within organized conservatism had the same problem. They'd gotten a little bit flabby, a little bit lazy. Uh, and that's why so many of them turn never Trump. I, I see a lot of people who really hopped on that train. And for a lot of them, I think it's personal. I think they feel like Donald Trump discredited their life's work or accomplished more than they were able to do in, in decades. And, and I think they resented that a little bit. Uh, and then the, my, my final remark would be on uh, David bashing Enoch Powell. Why you gotta do that? Um, I, well, actually there, there are two reasons why I say, why are you doing that? And the first is that Enoch was great, but let's, let's bracket that for a minute. The Rivers of Blood speech was given 20 years before I was born. So rather than relitigate that, let's talk about demographic replacement right now. The number of people who have come over to the United States through Joe Biden's broken border, the clock stands right now, is it up to 7 million? That's more people than live in the state of South Carolina. There is nothing less conservative than demographic replacement or demographic change of that magnitude so swiftly. Because as Edmund Burke would tell you, and as Ann Coulter will frequently tell you if you read her Twitter, immigration is the one issue you gotta get right because it's permanent. If you get your tax code wrong, you can rewrite it. But if you think it, mass immigration is gonna be fine and then it's not, it's too late now. You, you, people cannot be deported. Generations cannot be deported. You have altered your country permanently. So that's really the one issue you really want to get right. And I don't see a lot of conservatism in the Democratic Party's approach to that. Matt. So I... Uh listening to these remarks, first of all, I, I just thought it was mesmerizing. I could listen to both of you uh, uh, for another half hour each. Uh, it was just great. Uh, uh, I would happily stay. Um, as, as you were talking, uh, just a number of the comments brought me back to, from both of you, brought me back to um, this thought that your reference to, to, I think there's a reference to social media by Matt, a reference to fragmentation by David. 
uh, a reference to humility, uh, it brought me back to the idea that I think in a lot of ways, what broke America was some combination of Tom DeLay, Anthony Kennedy, and social media, whoever we want to blame for inventing that. Um, because DeLay, uh, through his uh, realizing that if you could seize control of the state legislatures, you could district in a way that would create safe districts, uh, was the beginning of the end of moderates who could compromise. Your only incentive at that point uh, was to win your primary in your safe district, and that drove polarization and fragmentation. And Anthony Kennedy, for a lack of humility, believing that every issue was his to solve through a judicial decision, uh, rather than allowing the democratic process as messy as it is to solve the big issues. Um, you know, whether that's his breaking at the last second in 92 to sustain uh, Roe and Casey or a litany of decisions after that. Um, and then social media just exacerbating all of this, eliminating the little plat little platoons and creating one mass, um, but an impersonal mass, uh, even an anonymous mass uh, where you could yell and scream at each other uh, with no accountability, with no empathy, with no sympathy, with no understanding of people's circumstances. And so just those comments together sort of made me think that those three personalities, figures, um, in some way are emblematic of that undermining of conservatism that I think has really brought us to the moment where we are. The one question I would have for Matt is you referenced Obergefell, and I've heard that thesis before, and I've thought a lot about it. And, and I'm, there's certainly an element of religious conservatism that feels alienated by that decision. But it seems, I wonder whether that's really an explanation for Trump. Maybe, maybe you're right that 16 is still close enough to 15, but it seems like at this point, the country's moved past that. And so I wonder um, how much that is really still a motivating force or whether it really has at this point all become about immigration, even less so than, than national, or foreign, foreign policy. Well, I think it's a great question, and of course, all of these uh, phenomena are multi-causal. Um, I, I would say that in the years since Obergefell, um, the, the equal rights movement went in a turn that did not increase religious conservatives' confidence in America. And so the next stage after the same-sex marriage victory was the transgender rights movement. And that has only continued to alienate the right from American culture and from the left. And so the idea that the powers that be are propagating ideas that are hostile to biblical morality, um, I think has greatly opened the door to a search for uh, what's called the, you know, David said there's no international conservatism. There does seem to be an international populism. Mm -hmm. And they are definitely against LGBT rights. Uh, and that is, that's one of the foundational commonalities they have. So I would kind of look at it that way. Um, I would just say, um, I, both of our talks, um, mainly because we, we both wear glasses, we're very focused on ideas. You may not, we like to read books. And we're very interested in ideas. We arrived at conservatism through thinking about uh, the, the, the world and uh, the, the place of the individual in relation to the community and the nation, and the polity. That's, of course, not how most people become conservative. And I think there's a difference, as shocking as that might sound, I think we always have to keep in mind the differences between a philosophical conservatism and then political conservatism that it's expressed in the United States of America. And just a couple thoughts on that. The first is that it, since uh, for the last 100 years or so, last 90 years, conservatism has been very closely tied to populism in the United States of America. Populism fundamentally is a movement of outsiders, people who feel excluded, people who feel 
that the big institutions are weighing them down. Well, that's an odd position for a conservative to take because conservatives are supposed to be for the institutions. We're supposed to be the ones saying, hey, don't change things, or this is the way things ought to be. Let's proceed gradually and with great caution. So why is it that conservatives and populists overlap or often have found themselves working in harmony over the last 80 years? I think that's because of contingent events in American history, primarily the Great Depression, which inaugurated the New Deal, which meant that FDR's brain trust and all of, uh, all of his progressive-minded liberal thinkers were now in positions of authority in Washington, D.C., and creating, really, this fundamental structure of government that we continue to live under today, as well as World War II. And the combination of Great Depression and World War II, Pearl Harbor, that essentially delegitimized the prior conservatism. And David touched on this a little bit last night. But it was possible, I believe, in the 1920s to say, well, the conservatives were for the establishment. In fact, they didn't even call themselves conservative. Harding and Coolidge said that they were simply normalcy men. <laughs> They're for normal. Who doesn't like normal, right? They were Americanists. They believed in America. They believed, by the way, in all three things that David outlined, whether it's the ideals of the revolution um, and the fundamental equality that is associated with that revolution, with the idea of mobility, and with the idea of individualism as it relates to capitalism. But the combination of the New Deal, the Great Depression, and World War II essentially marginalized them. And so from that moment on, it was conservatives who had to make arrangements with outsiders and conservatives adopting a populist rhetoric because they were outside, they were excluded, and they needed to get into the institutions or subvert and create alternate ones. David? Yeah, first I, I want to hope Matthew knows this better than I. When you mentioned Anthony Kennedy, the, I thought you were going to refer to a famous quote in one of his decisions which is the one we have the right to define our own view of the universe. Can, can you recite that? Do you know that well enough? Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to say it right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Part of liberty is the ability of the individual to define one's place, one's place in life. Oh, universe, yeah. So, so that that is like the least conservative idea it's possible <laughs> to imagine. Because conservatives might be, believe in individual liberty, but we don't believe in moral liberty. Morality is a shared cultural construct that we build together. And the idea that everybody comes up with their own worldview is A, wildly impractical if your name is not Aristotle, because most of us can't come up with our own worldview. And B, it creates a complete social and moral atomization of society. And Anthony Kennedy didn't make that up. He was pulling from the ether. Uh, and so I do think that was part of the cause that that ether undercut a lot of what I would call conservative in conservatism and led to the libertarian moment, which I think lasted a little longer than six weeks, but maybe 10 years. Uh, and so I, I do think Anthony Kennedy, or, or at least that idea, had a big role. But we might as well, let's get to the question of immigration. Yeah. And, and so we both referred to the phrase neoconservative, which lately you know, conservative, if it means anything anymore, means support for the Iraq war. But in my family's history, as Jewish immigrants on the Lower East Side, it meant coming here, being like most Jewish immigrants were, super left-wing, going to City College, and for you college students at City College, which was the free university for poor kids in New York, the faculty was okay. But mostly what they did was go to lunch. <laughs> uh, and they went to lunch for eight or nine hours a day. And the famous part of the cafeteria were these alcoves, they were these hollows. And there was one called Alcove One, where the I think the Stalinists ate. And the, there was one called Alcove Two, where the Trotskyites ate. And so they were all communists, but they were debating what kind of communism should re prevail. And so the Stalinists were way dumber than the Trotskyites. <laughs> and so in good Stalinist fashion, they forbade anybody in Alcove One to talk to anybody in Alcove Two, because they'd get their rear ends wiped in debate. <laughs> and so there were a bunch of Trotskyites in Alcove Two, uh, and there were names like Irving Kristol and Daniel Bell and Nathan Glazer. And they were all wanted to rise in America. And they were making it in the academy and other places. And my grandfather was there at the time. 
he went into law. And along come the 1960s, and they see two things happen. One, that the, they were immigrants and they were left wing, but they believed in bourgeois values. They believed in the regular values of being industrious, working hard, respecting authority, and climbing the ladder. So that's, and then they saw those values under assault by the new left. And then the second thing they saw was a lot of progressive great society programs failing. And so they turned right for these two reasons. And so my heroes growing up were in this community, the Irving Crystals of the world, the James Q. Wilsons of the world, the Night Blazers of the world. Uh, but they were the kids of immigrants. And so what you had was the, was maybe uh, not for the first time, but a moment when you had an infusion of conservative thought funded by people who are immigrants and were profoundly supportive of immigration. And so I think I grew up in that tradition and remain profoundly supportive of legal immigration. And so when you talk about replacement, like I taught at your alma mater, uh, and I remember one year I had a class that was 40% international. And I thought, I wonder if this is gonna go well, or maybe they won't understand each other. And it went great. And I was recently out at OpenAI, and you can support or not what OpenAI is doing. But the hard part about writing about artificial intelligence is it's super hard to spell all the names because they come from all over the world. They're from so former Soviet Georgia, Nigeria, Thailand, Vietnam. And it is, we're not supposed to use this phrase melting pot anymore, but it is genuinely a melting pot. And so I greet this, I greet what's happening on the southern border as chaotic and appalling. But I greet the demographic shift in our society as an awesome source of dynamism and talent, and that's making us a nation that's not only thriving, but demographically way better than any country in Europe. And so I come as a conservative, but super supportive of legal immigration. And I, I get the sense you don't share my opinion. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, you, you don't have to tell me that the kinds of people who come to Yale as international students, as diverse as they may be superficially, are all speaking the same language. They most certainly are. Uh, yes, there is a, all kinds of cross-cultural communication there. But that's, you know, I, I feel like people who say demographic change is fine because I'm in lots of diverse environments and they function well are talking about places like Yale. They're not talking about small towns in Wisconsin that have suddenly gotten more refugees than they know how to handle, um, and suddenly their government services are overburdened, um, and or people who live in Texas who say, you know, my, my town is starting to look more like something south of the border. So, you know, I things that look fine from the point of view of New Haven don't always look fine um, from the point of view of North Carolina or Texas. Yeah, I, I use bad examples, but if you look at the number of Americans who have somebody from a different ethnicity in their family, it's like 35% of Americans. And so that's pretty mass. And then if you look, let's just take um, the Hispanic population. A bunch of years ago, I don't know how many years ago, a sort of conservative political scientist named Samuel Huntington wrote a book called Who Are We? Was it? Yep. Um, and so he said, there, uh, Hispanics are not rising like other immigrant groups. Our immigration system is fundamentally, fundamentally broken. You could not write that book today because Hispanic education levels surpassed white education levels in 2012. Surpa Hispanic incarceration rates are way below. Hispanic e economic opportunity is going up. And Hispanic voting patterns are reflecting American voting patterns. Mm -hmm. I used to be in debates with political sci scientists and pollsters, and the debate would be, are Hispanics Irish or are they Jews? <laughs> and the difference is, as Irish got richer, they, their voting patterns looked like American. As Jews got richer, they stayed Democrats. <laughs> but it turns out Hispanics are Irish. Yeah. And their, their voting patterns are beginning to resemble America. Uh, and so to me, th these are all signs that we are achieving something that's kind of remarkable, which is a mass multi multicultural democracy. Uh, and this is not only happening at OpenAI and Yale, and I regret the examples, but it's happening in it pretty much every, everywhere you go. And I mean, McCook, Nebraska, town is like 40% Latino and they're mixed in. You go to Compton, I'm, I, I'm a fan of hip hop. So I went to straight out of Compton. <laughs> it turns out that Compton is now 60% Hispanic uh, and they're, they're thriving. Uh, and so I don't see the threat that 
maybe you see? Well, I, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but if there's one point I make on immigration, it ought to be this. You, you brought up voting. The supposed Hispanic swing to the Republican Party is overhyped every single election, um, and it's, it's really essentially illusory. Mm. Every immigrant group is consistently, lopsidedly democratic. Uh, not just Hispanic immigrants, but Asian immigrants uh, are are even more democratic than Hispanic voters uh, in the U.S. California looks like the America of the future demographically. California today is a one-party state. I I don't want to live in a one-party state, so I I demographic change will consign the Republican Party to electoral oblivion, and I think that's bad. I, I don't want to go out on a limb or anything. just want to make a few uh, points of interest. I think uh, some of the voting patterns uh, you describe are accurate according to government-imposed census definitions of ethnicity. And so the demographer Richard Alba at New York University has done, this is, hey, I get to cite some academic work, finally, uh, has done fantastic work about how as immigrants assimilate, uh, they s- stop assigning themselves to these demographic categories. They, they like my predecessors, my immigrant story, they simply become part of that generic white vote. And when you think about patterns of intermarriage among Americans of all ethnicities, uh, when you think about the simple refusal to be assigned one of these categories, I think they're outmoded. I think they're useless. I think the Hispanic voters want the same thing as black voters, want the same thing as white voters. They want a good job, safe streets, good schools, and the world of peace. And so we get ourselves into rabbit holes. You talk about California. Of course, there's been a lot of change in California over the last 35 years. One of the biggest changes is that progressive policies have driven the middle class out of California. That's not an immigrant story. It's the government of California exiling the voters who would be Republican. And all those voters have gone to places like Texas or places like Florida or places like Idaho or places like Montana, and they're Republicans. So the problem isn't immigration. The problem is, as a conservative, the left. <laughs> well, you, uh, you theorists here are tempting me as an empirical voting specialist to get into this argument, but we're going to uh, get the audience involved here uh, if we can. Uh, questions from the audience? We have uh, our microphone over here, so uh, please let us see your hand. Boy, we settled every issue confronting the... Yes, Get Noah back there. And Noah, big, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. You're next, um, Noah. Yeah, there's this idea of anacyclosis where societies all through history have gone from, let's say, the strong man and then the oligarchs who uphold them, and then they get a little bit too much. You get populism or sort of the, uh, the rule of the mob, and it just goes in this hellish circle. And I've heard people like Andrew Clavin speak to the idea of anacyclosis, suggest that we set up this country with three branches of government so that you put those three forces in tension with one another and and, and manage anyway. I would love it if you guys would speak to that idea, whether you agree with it or not. And um, to the current time, and you've talked about populism, but we could just trade one excess for another for another in a chain. And so anyway, sorry for the long statement, but... Could you just speak to that idea and what you think about it, pro or con? What are the three forces again? Let's say you start out with the strong man out of chaos. And pretty soon as order extends, then you have oligarchs who support the, the strong man. And pretty soon it's them. Some would argue with, you know, like with the Googles and stuff, maybe that's what we've got now. But as the oligarchs get a little bit too big for their bridges, then the next thing you know is you sort of you, you descend into populism or mob rule. And I'm not trying to insult anybody or oversimplify. But history, some people say, has gone in that big cycle back eight, ten thousand 10,000 years. Uh, it seems to me there's a lot of credence to that. And we maybe are in one of those transitions now from oligarchs to the, to the mob or to pure democracy in, insisting. 
How do we break the cycle and get back to the 200 years that this country seems to have enjoyed, not perfectly, but, but putting those things in tension? And you don't have to agree with my thesis, but that, that's what I'm trying to ask. Anybody want to? So, so in law school, uh, when you take constitutional law, the, the base level course in constitutional law is not in individual rights, uh, but is in government structure, uh, separation of powers, the, you know, what's delegated to the, or what's assigned to the judicial, executive, legislative branches. And most people think that's really boring and they, they want to get on to the 14th Amendment and the much more interesting parts of the Constitution. And I actually think that that's a mistake, that much more important is the structural arrangement and that maybe if I'm going to assign blame to you know people who ruined America, I can throw FDR in there uh, because I'm concerned that the regulatory state, um, uh, I, I, have, I, I do believe that the regulatory state creating essentially a fourth branch of government removed from the people unaccountable where Congress writes statutes saying do something reasonable, making no hard decisions and then leaves it to the regulatory state uh, is problematic, uh, uh, that, that undermining of our structure. I likewise am very concerned about judicial independence and attacks by Donald Trump or others on judges and um, they're not beyond criticism, but I worry about attacks that rise to the level of attacking independence. At the same time, I'm also concerned about judges who want to take on uh, every issue. Every issue becomes something we have to adjudicate in court, whether that's 14th Amendment disqualification from the ballot uh, because it serves our interest in disliking him uh, or any number of other issues where state attorneys general now try to push policy agendas through adjudicating everything by bringing lawsuits in districts where they know they can draw one particular district judge. I think all of these things uh, undermine the constitutional structure. Um, and they've been incremental uh, on top of, you know, one on top of each other. Each attorney general now is to try, tries to one up every other attorney general on what issue they can push in front of a single district judge in some uh, district. And I think all of those things undermine the structure of our government, the separation of powers, in a way that's much more uh, important or detrimental than questions about individual rights. I'm, I would say I'm generally skeptical of cycles of history theories because they're, they're kind of too neat. But I'm about to give you one which I think sort of overlaps with yours, but is not the same as yours. And it's not one I invented. It's one I've already criticized Samuel Huntington. Now I'm going to praise Samuel Huntington. He wrote a book in 1981 called The Politics of Disharmony. And he observes in that book that it seems like every year, every 60 years in American history, we have what he called a moral convulsion. And so at these moments, then people get sick of established power. People try to tear down the authorities. A new passionate generation comes on the scene. There's a new form of social media or communications. Uh, and people, outsider groups want to get inside. And it's pretty anarchic. And he says this happened in the 1770s, which I guess was sort of oligarchic. Uh, it happened in the 1830s with Andrew Jackson's populist era. It happened in the 1890s. Uh, and then it happened in the 1960s. And so these were bumpy moments of moral convulsion. And he writes in 1981, he says, I don't know if the 60 year cycle thing is a thing, but if it holds sometime around 2020, we're gonna have another moral convulsion. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking pretty good, pretty good call. <laughs> and I think moral convulsions can be seen as Thomas Kuhn paradigm shifts. That we have a social paradigm, which in incorporates a set of ruling ideas, a set a ruling culture, maybe a ruling class. And that, that culture works for a little while. And then after a while, it stops working. And you have to go through this incredibly messy process of chopping it up. And those chopping up periods, these moral convulsion periods, are just scary to live through. 1968, 1972, I think there were like 4,000 bombings on college campuses in 1972. Uh, and so we're living through one of those. But if Huntington says the good news is you come out of them. And that people learn to remake the culture. And so after there were those 4,000 bombings in 1972, by 1977, the kids were all into crystals and asps and meditation. Like, it, it, we came out of it. <laughs> and so my hopeful thing is we, we had a 
a very individualistic culture from 1960 to 2013. And there was right-wing individualism, which was about economics. There was left-wing individualism, which was about lifestyle freedom. And we sort of overshot the mark with too much individualism. And now we're having a fight about what sort of communalism we want to prefer. And the left has its version, which is more ethnic uh, identity. And the right has its version, which is more American or national identity. But we're fighting over which kind of community we want to have. And I'm hopeful we'll have some sort of reconciliation between these things. Well, uh, we have cycled all the way around our time, I'm afraid, uh, and uh, we have to bring this to a close. Um, as we wrap up the evening, let me invite you to the March 20th Tocqueville event, in which we will hear from Yale sociologist Phil Gorski on the other side of the political spectrum, liberalism in America. Uh, and it took four uh, eminent scholars here to talk about conservatism, and Phil's going to do it all uh, on his side of the fence uh, himself. So, uh, but it ought to be a very uh, insightful presentation. So please join us for that. And now let's show our appreciation for our panelists.